Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to you. Our desire is to bring some actionable insights to you on how you can positively apply behavioral science into your life, hopefully with a few laughs along the way. So we're like the the comic behavioral scientists? Is, is that oh, it? comic is pretty far from anything that I would call us. Maybe we're just some behavioral science clowns. <laughs> I think that might be more appropriate. Yes. <laughs> okay. So before we introduce today's guest, we want to start by thanking you for all of your support for the podcast, the reviews, the ratings, the Patreon subscriptions, all of it are just fantastic. And we want to thank you for helping us expand our reach. That's the truth. We are always looking for ways to reach more people who are interested in applying behavioral science to their work and life, and your support goes a long way in achieving that. The algorithms that recommendation engines use rely on reviews and ratings and downloads. So every time you leave us a review or rating, you're getting us a little closer to coming into someone's search bar when they're looking for a podcast. So thank you. Thank you very much for that help. Yes. Thank you so much for all that you do to help us. Okay. So let's turn our focus to this episode. Our our guest today is Michael F. Shine, who is the author of The Hype Handbook, 12 Indispensable Secrets from the World's Greatest Propagandists, Self-Promoters, Cult Leaders, Mischief Makers, and Boundary Breakers. Woohoo! Yeah. (laughs) That's a hell of a title. He is also the founder and president of Microfame Media, a marketing agency that specializes in making idea-based companies famous in their industries. We had a fascinating discussion with Michael about his book and why hype is often misunderstood. We explored the idea of if the ends justify the means, which we're going to dig into more in the grooving session, as well as talking about music that I could actually be knowledgeable on. Punk. Punk? I, really? Like you you called Depeche Mode Punk. Like synth rock, okay, industrial, yes, but punk? I think you're stretching things there. You, you, okay, so Depeche Mode isn't punk, but I had a big uh, punk. I, I liked you, you punk. Really? I was I name, listened to name, black. Name a punk punk band. Black Flag. All okay. right. Okay, there you go. Okay. Okay. It, okay. Just right there. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. You good know, enough. And I mean, I travel in a pretty narrow band of my music, unlike you, who has this, you know, <laughs> plethora of of wide range from classical all the way to the, you know, weird Brazilian <laughs> jitsu <laughs> samba intermixed with smooth jazz and oh, I don't know, whatever else. That's do. what's it's so much I'm fun, really, though. I'm really narrow. <laughs> I, I do I do my 80 synth rock and some punk. There you go. But Black Flag is definitely a punk band. Husker I'm, Du, a local Minnesota band, is definitely a punk band. No, no way. You when you have a two no. minute when you have a two minute song, which is the longest song on your album, that is a punk band, <laughs> and it is all just guitar and screaming. That is punk. Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. Debate later. Let's. Okay. <laughs> all right. There we go. All right. Um, so, please sit down. And relax with some black flag or violent phlegms playing loud in your background and a big shot of hype in your glass as you listen to our conversation with Michael F. Shine. Michael F. Shine, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. I am happy to be here. Yeah, we are glad to have you here. We're going to start with a speed round. Kurt, you want to get it going? I will start. So, Michael coffee or tea coffee by a long shot i tried to switch over to tea i even write about in the book i just published how i switched over to tea and it made me calmer and then i fell off the wagon (laughs) (laughs) so so the calm thing wasn't you huh is that how that works the calm thing is certainly not me which is why i should not be drinking coffee and as we can talk about if you want to um implement some of the things that I preach, it's better to be calm, but I just really, really <laughs> like coffee. So this is definitely do what I say, not what I do. In regards to coffee, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So would you rather have dinner with your favorite musician or favorite sports star? A musician by far. Yeah. Uh, by Any, far, anybody right. come to mind? Can they be 
dead. Sure. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. That could be dead. Let's let's say anybody ever. We have some magical thinking going on here. We can do that. Yeah. Bo- Bowie. Oh, oh, David Bowie. Yeah. He would be. Yeah. That's a fascinating one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Learn a new language or learn a new instrument. I think I'm in a phase where I want to learn a new language and I'm a a big music guy, but I I feel like it's silly that I don't, that I'm not fluent in more than one language. Like I feel like I'd really like to get there and I've I've tried and I'm not there yet. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could, we can, uh, you know, beat you up on that later if 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 that would help you feel better, but let uh, last speed (laughs) round, last speed round question. I I like, I like, I'm a masochist or is it a sadist? I forget. I like to be (laughs) flogged. I was confused the two. Yeah. Um, do you think more people? Do you think people today are more susceptible than they were in the past? To to to, to which part? To to hype. Do you think they're that they're more susceptible to hype today than they were in the past? I don't think they're more su- susceptible. I think human brains are human brains. I think that there are technologies that make it easier to be exposed to to ideas that make you more susceptible but no I, I don't great well let, well let, let's let's talk about what what about technology you think is is preying on our brains in a way that that um, that is is altering us and altering the way that we respond to hype so it's funny so we we for for those of you at home we were having a conversation on this line before we started recording and we were talking <laughs> oddly enough, about George Orwell and 1984 and how 1984 is one of my top five favorite books. However, I actually think that, um, uh, what's his name? Aldous Huxley, the guy who wrote Brave New World, I think he got it more right because, Mm -hmm. you know, the Nazis and the communists and all of that, they use technology too. I mean, Hitler and Goebbels loved the radio. Like that was their technology, but you could turn the radio off, you know? And there were still a large segment of the population who had to be forced to be bombarded with that information and bullied into it and coerced into it. Whereas now we have so much technology that makes our life, quote unquote, easier. And I would say more distract. It just distracts us. And we submit to all this stuff. Like I don't have an Alexa because I just don't like the idea of Amazon listening to me all the time, even though I'm sure my phone does it, but people think I'm crazy. They're like, ah, it's convenient. Why wouldn't you? So the idea is everyone is like, we're, we're just immersing ourselves in a bath of messaging and distraction and all of these things from the minute we wake up to the, to the minute we go to bed and, and, and we do it to ourselves. So yeah. Why? Why, why well, are we doing it? Why? Why do you think we're we're so compelled? Well, I think it's addictive by design. You know, I mean, it's the same reason you might be compelled to smoke cigarettes. You know, if you started that at one point, drink coffee, right? I mean, I know for <laughs> a fact. Yeah. yeah. No, really. I mean, I know for a fact that if I have more than two cups of coffee a day, I don't make as good of decisions and it's subtle. It's not like if I was taking cocaine, right? I mean, I, right. But, 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 but I'm addicted to it. It's pleasurable. And yeah. I think that these companies are very good at making things addictive. They've admitted to it. It releases dopamine. They make it, they design them like jackpot, like, you know, like slot machines. Yeah. So yeah. And well, they're, and they're is- fun. They're diverting. They're entertaining, you know? Wait. Yeah. Which is what Brave New World talked about, right? It was the, yeah. the as opposed to 1984, which was this top-down Big Brother overseeing everything. You know, Brave New World was we're giving you pleasure, we're giving That's you right. these entertainment, and that will calm the masses and and allow us to control you. Which is to a certain degree, we have Facebook and Twitter and all the social media things. But as you said, there are other facets around this that we are inviting those components into our lives and and that invitation gives you know uh, it, it also acts as oh if i'm inviting them they can't be bad um and so i think there's some some interesting components on that and and i think the hype aspect of it and how companies are are using that can be a really uh 
subtle way of thinking about psychology and not actually not even so subtle. I think it's a really powerful way of thinking about psychology and what they're doing. And, you know, is it a positive thing or is it a negative thing? And I think that's a big piece that you talk about. It's funny because um, when I was 15 years old and, and, or whenever I read both of those books around the same time, I read brave new world for school and read 1984 on my own. And I don't know how much your listeners know about these books. We're getting a bit literary, but in, <laughs> but in brave new world, it's this society where everyone, you know, there's promiscuity there, you know, that's, that's encouraged by the state. There's, um, and not, not close relationships. There's drugs, there's television all the time. And 1984 is like boot on the neck, you know, misery, torture, whatever. So I remember thinking at the time, like, yeah, I, I know I'm supposed to think that Brave New World is terrible, and it is, but part of me wanted to be there. It seemed, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wasn't really um, such a hit with the ladies at the time. I certainly wasn't really enjoying my life at 15 years old in this place where you could just, you know have a harem and like, you know, uh, and everyone had the harem, the men and the women and have entertainment all the time. So it's a function of, yeah. Is it terrible? Well, no, but at the same time, these people didn't have autonomy. So it's a question of, do you want to, do you want autonomy in your life? Do you want to control your decisions? Do you want to, or do you want to be like a child and have people making decisions for you, or maybe a combination of both. It's, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that, that's, that's pretty great. I remembering back to when I read them as well and uh, felt like both are absolutely about control, whether yeah. w- w- one way or the other, uh, that is, that is definitely it. And, and I think about controlling the message you, you wrote about like Tim Ferriss, um, becoming uh, or, or claiming the title of a world-class uh, kickboxer. Right. And, uh, and if I, and correct me if I, if I get this wrong, but there was, there was something about how he wasn't really the very best in the world. He wasn't consistently a, a, a best in the world kickboxer, but he did, he, he did get to, he got a title and, and this was a, a source of irritation for you. If, if, if I recall, right. I guess it was a source of irritation. I just found it interesting whether it was a source of irritation, but also, yeah, I wrote in an article. So I have a book, the hype hand book, and I mentioned Tim Ferriss a little bit, but in the article, I, I really criticized Tim Ferriss because Tim Ferriss is a guy who is telling you how to live your life to have a better and more efficient life. Mm -hmm. And he'll say with pride that he, so what he did was he decided he wanted to be the best kickboxer in the world. And he researched and found a loophole in kickboxing that said that if you make someone like stumble and put their foot, even like a centimeter outside the circle three times you win. But That's there kind of the way, you know, it's a norm that you don't do that. It's, it's a law to keep people in the circle. So they're not running through the aisles like professional (laughs) wrestling, but, but the goal is not to knock someone out of the circle, but he did that. He, 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 he didn't try to be the best kickboxer. He, um, wanted to have that title. So it's a, and he, and he made that happen. And in the kickboxing world, that's disgraceful. I mean, that's not honorable, right? So I guess the question is, is winning at all costs um, the goal? Because he was trying to show that he thought outside the box or whatever co- corporate jargon you want to put there. Maybe. But at the same time, is is getting the title always the goal or is the goal to... Yeah, be a man, it, to master something. I don't know. Well, and and you think about that from the perspective of the means justifying the ends and and utilizing. It wasn't sumo wrestling. You're not trying to push the person to get them to step out. Yeah, that, that's this, not, that wasn't right. really the. It was a it was a rule, and he he found the rule and was able to you know use that to his advantage. But to your point, it wasn't the in the essence of kickboxing, it wasn't what professional kickboxers did or, or the, the world-class kickboxers weren't going, Ooh, this is how I win. No, they went through the 
whatever well, kickboxing is, right? The yeah, number scoring of, points and scoring whatever. points and yeah. various different pieces. Yeah. You don't you don't win on a technicality of, hey, I lost because I stepped out of the ring. And thinking about that to to your point, and I think the bigger question here is is does is winning no matter how you win the be all end all or is it how you win that is really important and i think companies uh, right in in this world of as you talk about in hype right the, the the you're hyping things and sometimes you're hyping things just to get attention and it has nothing to do with anything else within the realm of of the world and yet it seems like we fall prey to that uh, as humans we tend to fall oh you know I, I i go back to kim kardashian right i mean you know when she started off like what did she do or paris hilton you know i mean these are things like they're famous because they're famous and who cares however um, what, what what i like to say the other side of this is that if you want to if you really are doing good work in the world mm -hmm. and you want to learn how to promote that work and bring attention to it of course ethically but instead of listening to the advice that these people give so tim ferris is an advice giving guru so people live their lives according to what he preaches and they don't succeed or even kim kardashian they they listen to her interviews to a lesser extent and, and take her, her quote unquote wisdom, but that's, that's less common. But instead of sort of following their advice, observe what they do. So in other words, mm. Tim Ferriss did not need to be the kickboxing champion of the world for money. And you would say, okay, well maybe he did it because he's just competitive and wanted to be the best. Well, if that was the case, why wouldn't he want to master kickboxing? Why did he want to win on a technicality? It's clear to me that the reason he does things like that is because one of the principles of hype, and, and I talk about this in the book, is called become a magus. So if you can turn yourself into a larger than life figure who can do astounding things, and there are ways to do that even if you're not that astounding, people are more attracted to you. So mm -hmm. instead of saying, oh, I'm going to follow Tim Ferriss and, you know, follow his advice and work four hours a week and whatever, think, okay, why did he decide it was so important to do this thing and trumpet that accomplishment? And then how can I adapt that technique to get attention in my own career and do it ethically? That's always been my sort of MO and my message. But that's hard, right? In, in, in part, what makes your message uh, appealing uh, to me is that it's counterintuitive, that most people are listening to, are following Kim Kardashian just because of, of, of more surface uh, reasons, right? Not for the really actually paying attention to how is she actually living her life or what is she actually doing to, uh, you know, uh, in her life just to pick on somebody other than just Tim Ferriss. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, right? And and yeah. so why is it, what, Michael, why, why, why is it that we're, that it's just so much easier and for so many of us just to sort of follow the surface, just to, to play in, in the surface area. Yeah. I mean, I think for a couple of reasons, I mean, one is that it's counterintuitive. Like you, like you said, I mean, no one's really pointing that out. In other words, look, the word hype. So I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but I am a proponent of hype. And I define yeah. hype yep. as, all I define it as is generating a ton of emotion from a bunch of people so that they take the action you want them to take. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. But when most well-meaning people think about hyping something up, they think of it as negatively. So on one mm -hmm. hand, they, they associate hype with, with lying, which it's not, or with dishonesty. But on the other end of the spectrum, they just say, you know, my stuff should live on its own merits. You know, the cream will rise to the top. It, it, it should just get noticed on its own sake. And I think the first thing is that people need the case to be made to them that human beings Re and isn't this what you guys are out in the world preaching in a different way that human beings have certain ways that their brains work and they're not always the most accurate ways and they behave yeah. differently in groups than it, as individuals, even online. 
And if you want to attract attention and get people emotional and buy your stuff, whatever form buying something takes, you need to understand that. And that's not a negative thing. You can use that to launch a civil rights movement or you can use it to launch, you know, sell garbage. But that's right. I, I think people need that case made to them. And I don't think people understand that because very few people are making that case effectively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not the field of dreams, right? You, you can't exactly. just build it and they will come. You need to promote mm-hmm. it. You need to be able to get people to pay attention to it. So, so and, and I bit. want to interrupt for a second. It's also different than marketing. Like a lot okay. of people, there's not field of dreams, but also a lot of people are like, I just need to learn marketing. And when I say to them, well, what, what do you think of as marketing? Because I stay away from the word marketing. Okay. Because people will say, well, I got to build a big social media following. I have to do A-B testing. You know, I need to test which logos and, and phrases work. I need to, um, you know, uh, Clubhouse just came out, the new social media. I got to crack that one. I'm on that bandwagon quick. And I got to get analytics going. And all of that stuff's important. But those are the hammers and nails and chainsaws, you know? I mean... You still need to understand engineering and architecture, and that's human mass psychology. I mean, the ancient Romans were doing this stuff. So people start the wrong way. They start with the quote unquote marketing. To me, the hype is the what like what gets people worked into a lather and to, you know, and and let's start there and then let's figure out what technology to use. So I like go out of my way to avoid the word marketing because everyone wants to learn to be a marketer yet they're not succeeding because they they're they're worried about their sales funnels and their AB testing. <laughs> well, well, all right, let's go into this. So so you wrote the hype handbook. Uh, help us understand what big picture from the hype handbook, what's the main message and and what are you trying to to convey with that book? So I wrote the book and again, I, I own an agency, which people think of as a marketing agency. I like to call it a hype agency, but we do these kinds of things for, for clients. And I did it for myself when I was starting out, you know, as, as a freelance writer before I started the agency. Um, but the reason I wrote the book, um, one comes from a very sort of like mischievous place. And one comes from a place of really wanting to make the world a better place. So fr- from the mischievous place, I remember when I was a teenager, there was this thing that got passed around called the anarchist cookbook. And in retrospect, it was a horrible thing. So this kind of like hippie guy who was a radical decided he was going to give all the revolutionaries this one place where they could get all their revolutionary stuff. So it was like everything from like how to make a a Molotov cocktail out of household materials to like how to get high off of like marigold seeds, you know, any, anything you needed. It turned out people used this thing to kill people. It was horrible, but I just, the concept, people would pass it around. Like you got to see this thing. And the concept that there was this one place where all of this like secret knowledge was always sort of had an impress, made an impression on me. So I thought it would be neat to like look out and all of the people who were the greatest sort of mass manipulators or the people who could build movements, good and bad, you know, all of these kinds of people. If What if you could distill all of their stuff into like 12 strategies that you could use in any circumstance? And I think I've done that, you know, at the risk of patting myself on the back pretty well. So that was just something that was a cool challenge for me to do. And then there was another reason that's a little more Let's, yeah. let's get into the other reason, but before yeah. we do that, I just want to say the 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 subtitle, right? Twelve indispensable secrets from the world's greatest propagandists, self promoters, cult leaders, mischief makers, and boundary breakers, which I love. I nice. you know, I just <laughs> think that. It, and to your point, I think that's what you're you're talking about. Let's take these these insights from these people, good or bad, but we can we can look at the what they're doing, which is what I think you talked about with Tim Ferriss and Kim Kardashian as we started to lead into this. And now tell us about the the good reason why we're doing this. Well, and I think the good and mischievous reasons are connected. It was that I was watching people who I don't consider good people who had a very big effect on the world, in particular one person who was so good at using this stuff and people were so susceptible to it. And I, I just kept thinking like, there are all these 
nefarious characters who come to this stuff so easily. And and part of that reason is that they don't get emotional about it. That was back to my coffee and tea thing. Mm -hmm. For people who let their emotions get in the way, you have to work on regulating yourself because people like psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists, they're very good at looking at other human beings as players on a chessboard. So it's not that the ta tactics and strategies themselves are, are bad. They're just the way humans react. It's that they don't let shoulds and coulds and woulds get in the way. Um, but it bothered me so much that these people were really enacting hype on people and people were just responding like clockwork. It just, I, I wanted to put these tools in the hands of good people or people with good businesses, good artwork, good political causes that I consider good because they seem to come to it more it's difficult, it seems like, for the the more well-meaning people to bring attention to their stuff because they have so much shoulda, couldas, wouldas, you know, and the other people come to it naturally. So that became a driving force for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, I grew up in, a, in an environment where I, I just trusted people because people were trustworthy. And I remember seeing the movie uh, Wall Street where oh, Michael yeah. Douglas talks about greed is good. And it, it, he basically lays out this case where humans are just pawns. People are just ways for you to get richer. And the, with, the better you are at manipulating them and at manipulating the systems, uh, the better off you are. And I, that just was like, holy Hannah, that, that was a huge <laughs> yeah. uh, revelation for me. You know, even, even in this time of the yuppie spirit and, you know, go for everything that you can, it was still overwhelming. Well, and even though that's like a gross point of view. I think the other layer to it is that you can either frame it as people being pawns and that's what those kind of people do. Yeah. But the other way to frame it is that our brains are not designed to make accurate, to have an accurate view of reality. And that's what your entire podcast is about, right? I mean, we, we behave in a way that I guess made our ancestors more likely to survive and, and procreate. And we can't digest all the information thrown at us. So even if you love people, even if you want to do good things, you have to realize that if you are rationally explaining your ideas to people and expecting them to come along, you're not going to get much traction. You're just not. So you have to understand things like transcendence and um, why people follow certain kinds of leaders and why certain repetitious or repetitive, I don't think repetitious is a word, repetitive um, phrases and images work while others don't. You just need to understand that because human brains, for various reasons that we can talk about, are designed to cling to things based on those surface level signifiers. Well, you gave a great example in, in the book about Alice Cooper's manager. Uh, and uh, for, we'll have to explain who Alice Cooper is to some of the listeners, possibly. <laughs> they might not remember. But, but this whole idea of selling out Wembley Stadium, not by promoting how great the show is going to be, but by m making sure that the, the parents – who uh, would be uh, in, involved in maybe letting their kids go to an Alice Cooper concert, hated Alice Cooper, which gave the kids like this, this very irrational, uh, you know, thing of, of course, I'm going to go. If my parents don't want me to go, I'm going to make sure I go. Um, and, 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 and maybe you can tell the story of how that, how they, how the manager got that to happen. Well, first of all, it, it's worth saying that Shep Gordon, who is still Alice Cooper's manager. Wow is um, it seems like a decent guy, right? So here's an example of a person who, who um, I mean, I don't know him personally, but, you know, he's almost single-handedly responsible for the um, kind of that culinary movement, the celebrity chef movement, which made a lot of chefs who were doing great work able to sustain themselves in what was a difficult sort of environment before that. Um, Alice Cooper has nothing but good things to say about him. He's involved in charity stuff. So he's, he's a good guy. He's promoting art. He's promoting food. He's promoting good stuff. But his whole idea with Alice Cooper, they, they rose through the ranks together. He was, I think he might've been their, their drug dealer or something. I don't know, but you know, <laughs> here he was just like this pot dealer who hung around the same hotel and he needed a front for his um, weed dealing operation, which is Perfect. funny. Perfect. Yeah. 
And no one should write letters saying, well, that proves he's not a good person. This was 1969. He was, you know, whatever. So his whole theory was that he didn't want Alice Cooper to get on the cover of Rolling Stone, or he didn't care about that. He figured that every teenager, especially then, goes through a time where they're rebelling against their parents. So he wanted to get them in Newsweek and places like that as the bane of all parents' existence, as the thing parents hated the most, because he understood the principle of hype, I guess intuitively, that we're much more attracted to, um, our tribes are formed based on what we're against, not based on what we're for. And if he wanted to create a really strong bond around Alice Cooper, he would make Alice Cooper fans feel oppressed by parents. So he did that a lot. I mean, Alice Cooper was the original shock rocker. For those of you who don't know, you know, they used to have guillotines on stages. They used to have all kinds of crazy stuff. Also, there was a famous incident where they said he tore apart a chicken, which did not happen. Someone threw a chicken on stage and it shocked him. So he threw it back and the crowd tore it apart. But when Shep Gordon found out they thought Alice Cooper did it, he spread that like crazy, you know, that rumor. (laughs) So. They were in London. They were already big in the States, but they had Wembley Arena and it was like two weeks or something before the show and only 500 uh, seats had sold, which is Wembley Arena is very large. So that was going to be a disaster. So what Shep Gordon did is he he took a got a picture taken of Alice Cooper uh, buck naked, except for a snake like covering his nether regions. And he blew it up to a billboard and mounted the billboard on the back of a truck and paid the driver to have it break down. I think the guy actually went to jail, but he like paid him so much money that it didn't matter. (laughs) Not prison, just like jail for the night, you know? And so this giant picture of Alice Cooper buck naked with a snake was in Piccadilly Circus, which is the, it's like Times Square. It's the most trafficked area of London during rush hour. So there were like news helicopters, a giant traffic jam. And like, they even brought it up in parliament. They were like, this is a disgrace, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and parents were going crazy. I mean, this was when Britain was still, there was still a kind of a stiff upper lip crowd there. Um, and they sold out Wembley arena and became one of the biggest acts in the right. UK. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal to sell out Wembley. Yeah. Uh, especially where they were coming from that, that that's for sure. Well, I love the, I love the way that that was looked at, right? So to your point, that's we're, you know, tribes are based on what you're against more than what they're for and and understanding that concept and then figuring out a way to tap into that to say, all right, how do we get these, you know, people that are going to come to this concert? What's the tribe that we can we can get them around? And so what are they uh, against and, and various different things and appearance and all that I think is wonderful. What are some of the other factors in the book? Some of the 12 other ways that uh, you can hype? Well, first I want to say that, you know, people are probably listening to themselves and saying, well, I'm not going to put a picture of myself naked and do all this shock jock stuff, but there's a way to be against things or you don't have to be that extreme. Like you could say everyone in my industry thinks that it's really important to um, have ultra complex workflows. I mean, if it's the most brass tax industry in the world, just some real inside baseball thing, and you say, well, I believe in sim- simple workflows, you know, something that to everyone else would be boring, but in your world, you're really destroying a sacred cow. That works just as well. It doesn't have to be like, I mean, this was rock and roll. It was the business of entertainment. So it was theatrical by nature. So, some of the other, they're, they're, I mean, a, a good one that I use all the time is something uh, that, I, that I call create a secret society. I sometimes call it the piggybacking method. Uh, essentially, what the best hype artists do is they make it seem like all of their success is happening grassroots. When in truth, and they don't lie, they just make it seem that way. In truth, they almost always have spent a lot of time seeding a behind the scenes group of influential people who have followings of their own, who can pull the strings and make things explode very quickly. And you might say to yourself, well, how do I do that? There are ways to do that. So the way to do that, so like an example is, when I was starting out, I didn't know anybody. And I would 
monitor Twitter for people that I wanted to get to know until I saw them like leak something out that was human. So in other words, there's this guy, Brian Clark, who started copy blogger, who in the content marketing world is, is huge. And he would always talk about pretty like straight ahead content marketing stuff. And everyone's hitting this guy up all day long for content marketing stuff. But a few times I saw him mention like bands that, that we had in common and they were like underground bands, which I, I, you know, like, so I, connected. I said, Oh, you're into joy division. Cool. You know? So suddenly he became a 16 year old kid again. I talked to him about a human interest, not about what everyone else is talking about, trying to get something out of him for business. And we became, you know, I don't want to say friends because we don't even live in the same city, but we know each other and we've traded, you know, favors, so to speak. So, you know, just really trying to look at how you can connect with someone on a human level and sort of putting yourself in a position to do that is, is, is really useful. Yeah, this is this speaks to authenticity and 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 reciprocity and and just building building relationships, right? In, exactly. in, a, in a very simple way. Yeah. Uh, so so you don't think that that a, 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 you said that everybody needs a shtick, right? But it doesn't have to be controversial or provocative, does it? To, in order to be successful, no. But it does have to be contrarian. So yeah. then there's a difference. So. I think being a troll and just being controversial for the sake of being controversial can actually backfire. I mean, you see this sometimes people who they're not um, sophisticated about it. So they, they think, OK, I'm going to be a rabble rouser. So they just scream all the time whenever they're talking and shout at the, the their computer, you know, you know, YouTube channel. And they think that's enough or they use curse words. Right. Or or they just insult people on Twitter, you know. That's like a surface level understanding of what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about fabricating outrage for the sake of fabricating outrage. What I'm talking about is figuring out how to jump on the conversation that's already going on in your field, whatever that field is, and then adding something new to it. Because if you're not saying something that's against the normal way of doing business. And I'm just talking in business terms, but it can be anything. It can be art. It can be whatever. Why are you even there? So in other words, what I would do is just ask myself, what is a point of view held by people in my field that's just so entrenched that people don't even question it anymore that I honestly, in my heart, really find annoying and, and, and damaging and really angers me. And then speak out on that. Don't insult the, the messenger. Don't insult someone's looks. Don't call curse at people unless cursing is the way you communicate, but don't do it just <laughs> to be rude, you know, but call out points of view and give a better way of looking at the world. And 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 that works very well because there, I, I assure you there are other people thinking exactly what you're thinking who don't have the inclination or the courage to say it themselves. And then you can become the leader of that new tribe. They can coalesce around you. Yeah. I think it's really interesting when you talk about that, getting that different point of view, because that, so uh, that's really hard though, for, for a lot of people, because we hard. are, as you said, it's that it's those unwritten rules that we don't even pay attention to that, that we just make the assumption or we don't even make the assumption that they, they just are like, well, that's how it's done. I don't even know. I couldn't even fathom a different way of doing things. And so what I'm hearing you saying is, is we need to be better at actually taking a step back from the work that we're doing and really examining all of those facets to look at the underlying pieces in there and then and, and then take a, a really hard look and say, what are the things that are good and what are the things that I might disagree with? And those are the things that then I can bring forth into the conversation because there's probably others that are the same thing or maybe they haven't realized it just because they haven't uh, put that time and attention into focusing on those things. And so once I do draw attention to it, it will, it will grab attention. Is that? Yeah. And the, yeah. Well, first I want to say a few things about that. I mean, one is it, 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 this stuff is hard. I mean, a lot of things that are effective, especially from a, an interpersonal social point of view are very hard. I mean, walking up to someone you're interested in is really hard. That's not natural. We don't like rejection. Um, selling is really hard and very uncomfortable. I hated selling. I mean, I found it really uncomfortable, but 
I wanted to do what I wanted to do as a living and I just worked through it. So I, that that's the one thing I can't give you. I mean, you need to get the help you need to get. And I don't mean the help. That sounds like going to a mental institution. I, I just mean like <laughs> what whatever. But if it means therapy, that's fine too. In other words, like if there are, are things, if you're just kind of like, well, I don't want to do this. I, I can't do this. It doesn't feel natural. Okay. I mean, that's your decision, but these things work. They're effective. Um, part of the reason I wrote the book was to teach you how to do it, but just as much was to prove to people that these things work by using examples and data. And then you just have to make a decision, you know, I mean, if, if, if you're going to do it, and I, I, I guess, um, I forget the second thing I was going to say, we were uh, talking, I, I went off on that. You had mentioned something. Uh, you mentioned underground bands and it could, th this might be coming from the fact that you were in a punk band actually when you were younger, right? I was in a punk ish band that actually had a little <laughs> bit of mild success being that we had a following and a residency. I was in a series of punk bands, meaning that we were just loud and bad before that. <laughs> so, I mean, my first band was called the psychotic koalas and we were terrible, <laughs> but very funny. <laughs> but I love the name. It was a good wow. name. Our, our big highlight was um, it was when the Whitney Houston song, I will always love you was big. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a battle of the bands at school and we had our friend who was a large person dress up in tinfoil, you know, like Whitney Houston's like silver costume. And he sang the acapella version, like in a really terrible voice. And then we did a <laughs> punk version of the song. So that went over well. Um, All right. So, so that was hype. Well, so we were that, but my other band, you know, we were like punkish, but also kind of glammy and, and things. And that I played with guys a lot better than me. And I wrote the songs and, and um, yeah, we were, I thought we were pretty good. That that's cool. Okay, so what what underground music do you like listening to today? Well, now I don't know. It's funny. A lot of the bands I thought I was so original for looking for have like entered the canon, you know. So it's it's kind of funny. It was like um, as if everybody was listening to like you know these indie rock bands when like people weren't. But but um, I don't know. I mean, I I'm pretty unadventurous when it comes to new music now, which I'm disappointed in myself. But I think it's because I don't go out. Um, and I also don't think rock and roll is at the center of the culture anymore. I think it's just no. another genre, the way jazz or reggae are, you know. Um, but um, my favorite band, the band that got me into it all was a band called the Dead Milkmen, which is probably mm -hmm. where the psychotic koalas, you know, we wanted a name like that. Are you familiar? You guys nodded. Not everyone knows who they are. I've, yeah. I've listened to the Dead yeah. Milkmen I'm, many times. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were my favorite band and I still have a place in my heart for them. But then as I, I mean, I just became obsessed with music. I mean, um, I liked all, all those like, you know, I don't know, bad brains and fear and the descendants, but then I, you know, the sex pistols, the clash. And then I just expanded. I liked like the, a lot of like sixties music, but less the hippie kind of stuff. Like I liked the early stones and the early who, and I oh. love the Beatles and I even like some hip hop. I mean, I, I, I was, um, um, that was actually the first music I liked. I, we called it breakdancing music. I was into that before I was into <laughs> rock. Um, I just was a big music fan, I guess. I went through a blues thing. I just, you know. How about you guys? You guys are both music guys, right? No, no. Tim, Tim is the music. Oh, Tim more so. Tim, Tim is so, the okay. music guy. Okay, I just, totally the music guy. I, I, I live vicariously through Tim. Okay. So there, that's. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember uh, having a. a a roommate in college that that really introduced me to uh, the way the Brits were taking uh, reggae and ska, you know, and so it was early Police, but uh, oh, Boomtown yeah. Rats, and oh, yeah. you know, they were. Uh, I don't like Mondays. I remember that song. Yeah, that yeah, great. I don't like Mondays. Yeah. Song. It was fantastic, yeah. And, yeah. and and so we lived by those, and, and that sort of led into Sex Pistols and Clash, and 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 a, a lot of that early stuff as well. Yeah, that that whole reggae ska connection was cool. I know that like there were yeah. no punk albums, so the British punks would like listen to reggae stuff, you know. Yeah. And, um, now that, that scoffing got kind of corny, but it was really good in the beginning, like the specials and the stuff the Clash did. The and specials, all yeah. yeah, they were cool. Madness. Well, yeah. being from being from Minneapolis, we, you know, I, I, 
actually wasn't in Minneapolis at the time, but you know, it's close enough in, in Iowa that Husker do uh, oh, yeah, no replacements. early, re- early yeah. replacements. And some of those were some of the bands that kind of brought some of that punk into more of a mainstream sound, but still were having some of the, the background on that. But then you get, you know, the dead Kennedys and you get, some I love, of the, Oh, they the were, other, I forgot about them. They were one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Black Flag, and yeah. you kind of look at some of those from a punk perspective, and then, yeah, and then as you you know mentioned, uh, you know some of that British stuff that led into some of the the stuff that I was really into, which was uh, you know Joy Division, New Order, and that's, that's you great. Know, those those kind of um, bands over there. So See, I love the, this. The I still, replacements I, are funny because they were like almost famous, and they would relentlessly sabotage themselves. Like I remember my favorite story which is so stupid, but I love it. They opened for Tom Petty, which was like the, the gig of a <laughs> lifetime. And they, co- no, they covered, they went on and did Tom Petty's set. Oh and my got kicked God. off the tour. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, uh, this is, this is, by the way, uh, for those of you who are regular listeners, you'll hear every episode, Kurt will say, no, 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 I'm not the music guy. I'm not the music guy. You know, and Kurt just brought up a half a dozen great references. Yeah, you know, to, I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is, is this, is this a contrarian I, or I have, I have one genre that I can talk to. <laughs> is what's your genre? Like, like under, like indie it's, rock. It's, from it's the, it's the eighties yeah. kind of underground new wave punkish kind of bands and then yeah, and then Black tim Flag. goes off on tim goes off on like you know the this 1930s jazz thing <laughs> and then uh you know the classical composers from you know the 17th and 15th centuries and, the, and their differences and and to modern day folk and and other things and so i i stick to my i stick to my lane i, I i'm good in that lane otherwise i'm <laughs> I, not 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 there so i mean i'm sort of between you guys but i would say that if i had to pick like the music to my heart the stuff that got me excited about music for the first time it was that music that kurt likes like those bands were, were that was like my thing now, even more than like punk punk i liked like all you know violent femmes and oh, you know um one of, all that stuff one yeah. of the best concerts i ever saw was violent femmes in a, in a small little back room back of a bar in Iowa city, Iowa. They're and from around there, right? They're from nearby. They're from, they're area. from Milwaukee. They're outside Milwaukee. of Milwaukee, yeah. you know? And so that was, yeah, but it was, it was a fantastic show and, you know, somebody jumped up on stage and then they just stopped and, and the stage was literally a foot, you know, it was like a 12 <laughs> inch stage. It wasn't a big stage. It was yeah. a 12 inch riser that they had. And then they came back on like five minutes later and then the drummer wouldn't drum. And he's like, I've lost my concentration for five minutes. <laughs> oh <laughs> like, my God. Like, I've really? lost my concentration. It's it was like Guns and Roses. Yeah, it was a fast, fast. Fantastic. Way too fussy. Uh, <laughs> just just got to ask with all your music background, do you listen to music while you work? No, I, I, I really can't. I, I, I think I like music too much and I'm a little bit distractible. So if I have music on, it's a way of, it, it, it wouldn't be, it, it, I would listen to the music. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I think, I feel like the people who listen to music when they work most, and if you're different than this, excuse me, but the ones that I've seen are the ones who aren't like kind of obsessive about music. Cause I feel like real music, like hardcore music fans often listen to music. And for other people, it's like, a sensory thing, but maybe you guys are different. Maybe you guys do listen to music. Well, when you we've work. been, we've been tracking with this for, for, for some time. And by the way, uh, Kurt does like to listen to music when, when he's working and I, I don't, I like complete silence. I like silence. But yeah. I, th- but I think we've, you know, we've been asking this question for some time, Michael. And I think that my observation is that, that even people who are into music oftentimes like some kind of ambient sound in the background. Yeah, I get that. And it might yeah. be, you know, um, some people talk about smooth jazz, which, you know, that would uh, make me so angry if I had to listen <laughs> to smooth jazz that I would like break. I like that would just destroy any productivity for the day. And I would break computers. It would be so horrible. like too much Earl clue and Bob James in your history. I or what? don't even know what that is. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, this is where Tim, yeah. Tim comes up yeah. and he names these names. And oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, dry, yeah. dry leaves in a hurricane there. Well yeah. Over my head, you know, <laughs> so, I'm not a huge jazz fan. I tried. I rem- I have this memory. Okay. There was like acid. I mean, th- they had this acid jazz movement in the 90s, and it was like hip for a minute when I was a teenager, and there was this yeah. record store I used to go to. 
So I went and I bought some acid jazz albums and I put them on. And like 10 minutes later, I put them back in their cases, drove to the record store and traded them in for a ministry album. <laughs> oh, now, now there is a great, there is a great, uh, band, <laughs> ministry. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I, I couldn't Al, do it. I, Al, yeah. Jurgen, Al Jurgensen is, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is um, genius and, yeah. and too bad he, he used too many drugs, but no, you know, that's, you know, that's, yeah. uh, that'll, that that'll catch up with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there you unfortunately. go. Unfortunately, <laughs> okay. Uh, See, Michael. he went back to my lane, and yeah. I could. I, could I mean, talk my, your about lane that. is. I, I I veer from that lane, you know, and I like <laughs> old rock and roll, but like, yeah, that's sort of my lane too. Yeah. I would, so yeah. yeah. So so, what were you listening to between the ages of like thirteen and sixteen? Was was it this stuff? What this was it? Stuff, yeah, I had an old ex- only this stuff at that time. I mean, now I'm all over the place, but yeah, when I was um. When I was 12, I mean, you know, before I was 12 or 13, I would listen to, I don't know, you know, Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses and whatever, you know. And then um, I had an older, co- have an older cousin who was like a skater and like that cool older cousin. And he got me into the Dead Milkman and then a bunch of other stuff. And then my mom went to the record store for Hanukkah and said, my son is into the Dead Milkman. Is there anything like them, but that's not satanic? <laughs> so she brought home a Sonic Youth album and a Sex Pistols oh, album. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Sonic Youth and Dead Milk, but pretty much the same thing. Yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, it was, oh, it worked. I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, you know, so yeah, between 13 and 16, it was only that stuff. And that was a time where people weren't as promiscuous with their music. Like yeah. I discarded all of my like old material i'm like i'm only into like under alternative and punk music now but then as i got old it was basically those years that i was so obsessed with that kind of stuff yeah. funny that well, you, yeah. well what was what was the first record that you went out and bought by yourself this is you know this is going back do you, do you have a recollection question. it's embarrassing because well, with my own money i don't what know was it i like- remember you're not going to say like Olivia Newton John or something, are you? It's going to be that no, embarrassing. But you know, it? it's funny when my dad, my my father got a CD player, which was like new technology at the time, and we went to the um, record store, and he he like, I don't know, he he had like a hundred bucks, and he was going to buy CDs, and he told us to pick out the CDs because there was nothing to play on them, and I knew so little about music at the time. I bought like the California Raisins, sing the hits. <laughs> Okay, that is embarrassing. That is. I, I, I have no again, words. For, for, I, I, for some of our for some of our listeners, the California raisins <laughs> were a advertising thing to sell raisins. To sell, uh, yeah, and yeah, they were these little because they were singing. Uh, I heard it. it they I were heard it through the grapevine. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. then they expanded into like you know, I don't know, like Land of a Thousand Dances or something. Oh, I also bought when I was little. I remember. The WWF version of Land of a Thousand Dances. That's why I wear like the Iron Sheik and all of these people were singing, <laughs> you know, the different parts. So that was another one I liked a lot. Oh my gosh. Okay. Right. I'm, I, I think I, I think I, we need to we need to cut it off here because <laughs> <laughs> this is going even too crazy for us. <laughs> Michael, thank you. This uh I, I think it, you bring a really interesting perspective on this. And to to your point, hype is something that I think most people think of as negative, and I think you bring a, an, a contrary perspective to that and, and some really good insights. So thank you um, for for being on the show and, and for writing the book. And, and for our listeners, go out and get it. It's a, it's, it's a good book. Well, thank you guys for, um, you know, having me. And also it was fun to sort of be beyond the awesome questions and the really – in-depth conversation it was fun to have a chance to just geek out about music, which um, I don't get to do a lot anymore. <laughs> we none of us get to do it enough. I think all of us need a little bit more time just talking about music to just get our juices going again. So thank you, Michael. I've started to realize that I just uh, people don't want to hear it as much as I used to think they did. So now I think on a show like this with your listeners, it was fun to be able to do that. Yeah. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned with our discussion with Michael, have a free flowing conversation and talk about whatever else comes into our hyped up minds. Hype, man, he, he does put an interesting spin on hype because I, yeah. I always had a bad connotation in my mind with, with the word. Well, hype has that 
that kind of history, right? Like hype is not necessarily a good thing for in most people's minds. And so yeah. it's an interesting take. It's an interesting take. You didn't even notice I said minds instead of brains, did you? You know. I didn't. Were you were you were you intentionally was, trying to fool I me? Was in, I was no, I wasn't. I just <laughs> I, I realized that I used to mix it up more and I don't know, past six months I think I've said brains every time. I wanted to see if if, wow. if minds were different. Yeah, there you wow. go. It was such a subtle move. It was just, it was a lateral <laughs> arabesque. It was really just lovely. So what the hell is a lateral <laughs> arabesque? It's uh, it's just what my my old boss used to talk about when it came to just making a slight slight little move that just you know kind of throws things off, but perfectly. Oh, yeah, I like that. It's, yeah. it's, we we've talked about the impact that words have and the idea that changing one word can actually change people's perceptions of a product of a person of a event and subsequent behavior with that as well. So yeah. I like that. What was that called again? A lateral arabesque. Arabesque. All yeah. right. Which is a All dance right. move. So it is. Yeah. Hmm. It's a lateral one. I take it. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh my God, we are dig digressing already. This is this is a crazy one. All right, what do we want to what do we want to groove on here, man? What do let's we groove on? let's start our discussion. Who the hell knows where it's going to go? But let's start our discussion on 1984 or Brave New World. Right? Mm. First of all, let's just agree that what we're living in right now is pretty damn nearly dystopian. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. Yeah, I will. Cool. I will argue with that. I don't think it's dystopian. It's getting closer to dystopian. Oh, but okay. well, how much closer do we need to get to actually reach dystopia? Well, I think you know we are the vast majority of people, and this is this is the case. I think in, uh, across the board, the vast majority of people get along. We like each other. We have jobs that are going you know well there's obviously people who are hurting right now because of the pandemic and and everything else but for the vast majority of people in the world life is going on and we're 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 surviving and we're doing well granted if you looked at social media and you looked at news and you looked at some of those things but again if you think about the the number of people that stormed the capital right yeah small number thousands out of 330 plus million people in the United States. Agreed. You know, those those are are small numbers. They get hyped up in order and, and then we take a different perspective of them. So that that's a piece that, you know, I think is interesting. Fair enough. And okay. I, 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 it was bad for me to be looking at the glasses half empty side of that. Uh, there, there's certainly a glasses half full side of it. Uh, All right. So, okay. so, so for, for our listeners, so I, we would think or hope that most of you have, have read 1984 and Brave New World, fantastic books, 1984, yeah. George Orwell written in 1949. So right after the, you know, World War II. Yeah. Um, was there, but uh, Brave New World was actually written um, in 1932 by by Atlas Huxley, and uh, you know, again, both of them foretelling these future states that are dystopian in in their uh, living, but two different ways of looking at that, which is really interesting. And we talked a little bit about it in the in the show. You know, 1984 is Big Brother. It's totalitarianism. It's mass surveillance. It is this yeah. idea of, of you know, uh, lies are true and truth is lies and uh, double speak and all of these elements that are in there and everything is political. And Brave New World is, uh, again, the environment is engineered so that people are, you know, falling in, in line. This, yeah. They're falling in line, but they're also yeah. this element of they live in kind of a forced bliss uh, that this is, you know, <laughs> right. what the, what they thought was or what was conceived as blissful by, you know, having sleep learning and being psychologically manipulated. Yeah. yeah. Well, you didn't have you didn't have autonomy, but right. you were living in a world where hey, you had 
you know, sex and drugs and television, you know, I mean, it seemed kind of, you know, not a bad world. As, as Michael said, 15 year old boy doesn't sound too bad, right? To live <laughs> right. in a world where. Which is about you know, when I read it. Yeah. yeah. Which is about when I read it too. I think that's maybe the, yeah. the market for it, but. But it, that also makes me think about, uh, do we, would we rather know the truth uh, that that upsets us or live blissfully without it willful ignorance willful I ignorance mean, yeah if we think about if we think about this idea the psychology of willful ignorance this idea that we will willfully ignore information that is going to cause us cognitive dissonance this is not that far off right no, the idea no, that we not. would do that cognitive um biases are very real in allowing us to live our life without knowing the truth as long as we feel happy and that aligns with what we feel about ourselves yeah uh here's here's another uh sort of these maybe these are false trade-offs right it's not a 1984 world versus a brave new world world uh right i mean these were just two things that that came up early in our conversation but uh, would it be, let me ask you this, Kurt, would you like to have a guest on as a podcast guest who is a complete asshole, but is also a huge influencer in social media and could have a huge influence on a positive influence on the number of people that get exposed to, to our podcast? Which is this concept of does the ends justify the means, right? Yes. Yeah. Another somewhat false, you know, uh, equivalency. But on the other hand, we get faced with these kinds of questions, right? Uh, and and so d- is that a hype thing? Do we say, let's go for the promotional side of it at the uh, sort of at the, at what might be some kind of personal sacrifice? Or do you just say, let's just suck it up? I mean, really, it's just, a, it's an hour's worth of conversation. You know, it's some production time and, and who knows? There might be some. There might be a silver lining in there. Well, and 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 to the point, it comes down to these are where the nuances come into play, right? Because all right, is it just because he's a dick and an asshole, and and I, I made the assumption that it's a he, um, yes. But of this course. this of uh, but this idea of all right, maybe his concepts aren't that bad, or what he's talking about isn't bad. That that might be one way, and I would say maybe we suck it up for that, right? We get a big audience. We potentially expand. There's maybe some learning that goes on with that. On the contrary, on the contrary, what if it was somebody that had millions of followers and uh, they wanted to be a guest, but what they talked about was contrary to our belief that they said, you know, the world is flat and that they want to come on and talk about this flat world that we have, or the the idea that, you know, you can – tell our personalities through reading our palms. And if you, everybody just had their palms read, you know, you would be a much better world and that would be the way it is. And and you and I are not, as we've talked about, we're not gotcha journalists. We're not confrontational. And so we wouldn't probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe it would need to be where we change the way that we operate to get that person on. But would we do something like that? It would be uh, those are those are hard decisions uh, to make, and I think I'd kind of go back to Max Bazerman's model of of utility. Where where are we serving the greatest good? And and if if there's a lot of um, if if really the primary benefit is 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 for us and not for sort of the edification of our audience, I think I'd have a hard time with that. I think I'd have a hard time agreeing that it would be okay to have a a flat earther on if there was something that was particularly interesting about their perspective that might be, might lead to some interesting conversation, then maybe, but it would be difficult for me to, and you know, I say this at the risk of saying, I don't want to be exposed or spend any time with somebody who doesn't agree with my beliefs, but this is just science. (laughs) You know, this, you know, in this case, this isn't like, this isn't like some kind of, religious belief that I have. This is just, the world is not flat. And so for someone to come on and say the world is, is flat would be it, very difficult for me. It, to it is, it is agree. objectively false. 
and and you yes. can point to a number of different evidence. I mean, they knew the world was round hundreds of of years ago. You know the yeah. uh, you yeah. know the Greeks were able to do that with whatever that the well in in Egypt. I forget what that that well was called in the sun and solstice and all sorts of different pieces of of that. Just looking at um, shadows and various different pieces. But I digress, right? So. <laughs> I think this is a big digression. Yeah, yeah it so is. Hard. This whole this whole thing has been a big digression. So here's here's another question going down this rabbit hole that we're going down. All right, so maybe not a flat earther, but maybe a QAnon uh, believer. Okay. Right. Okay. Where it right. isn't necessarily so easy to objectively say that yes, th- your belief system is a hundred percent false. Would we? allow that person on because they would benefit us in the long run. Does that, does that bode well? And it's kind of contrary to, you know, our political beliefs, but also just from a objective truth piece, there's something missing there, but maybe not as clear as say the flat earther. Well, what can we learn? You know, uh, one of the uh, underlying principles of behavioral groups is is to expand the community of people interested in applying behavioral science if is, is there an application of behavioral science in, in a conversation with with a QAnon believer or would they just be a guest that wants to come on and just promote conspiracy theories or a specific conspiracy theory and I think that gets in if if their objective is to simply promote a, a, a conspiracy theory that would be in conflict with with what we're about I, I that would be easy for me to to justify not not having someone like that as a well guest. and we know I mean this is part of this we know that just being exposed to some of these false ideas those false ideas stick with people and so we, you know are we adding to uh, this confusion that is out there in the world right. by having that person on are some of the listeners going, Oh, well they, you know, they talked about this and then that's real because they forget to say that, Oh no, that's not true. Um, as we, as we go forward, it's a crazy piece, right? To think we've, about. Yeah. We've also had uh, people on uh, who are in support of, and against the concept of the replication crisis. Mm-hmm. Some people have argued, this, there's a, there isn't a replication crisis. It's just new. It's we're adding more nuance and more information to our knowledge base. And other people have said, no, the data is shit, and <laughs> and we've got problems. And you can't if if you can't replicate it, then it's not real. Yeah. And so we, we've had uh, those sides of it as well. But but I do feel like in those cases, this is a healthy debate within the scientific community around, not just around perspective or or belief system. It really comes down to uh, how do we go about, it it reveals a question about how do we go forward on replicating um, uh, research projects. And, And I think there is an element of that where you can look at interpretation as opposed to um, you know, objective truth or fallacy of that. And within interpretation, I think there's always nuance of hearing from both sides and trying to figure out, all right, how do I interpret this and how do I look at this? And are there different perspectives that I need to be taking? And to that, we're adding, hopefully, to people's ability to understand and to think through and to... Yes formulate an opinion on their own in that in that sense. And I agree with that. It's going back to to some of the things that we talked about with with Michael though, this idea that like Tim Ferris, right? Yeah. Taking a uh winning the world champion or whatever whatever championship it was that he he won in that kickboxing thing by exploiting technicalities in the rules. And then doing that it gets again to this this element of do you allow for people uh, is it okay to do that because you won and even though you won through what would be not necessarily cheating but not in a way that is in alignment with what most people would consider a good positive way of doing that 
thinking about, again, do we expand this podcast by, you know, false claims around what it is or bringing in controversial people just because they're controversial and don't add to the element, but ultimately it grows our audience and then we can then we can bring in this real piece. Is that something that we would be okay with? Um, I think you ask a good question uh, in that regard because, uh, I, and I, I would also use uh, Donald Trump, not not from a political perspective, but as a businessman, he's had a lot of failures, but he's also had some successes. And he has he's been able to sell a story overall of his tremendous success. And, 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 uh, and so there have been times, you know, there's been things brought up about his past where he, you know, cheated people. Uh, But overall, he's not been punished for, for that. And Tim Ferriss has not really been punished overall for, for making these claims uh, because he actually did achieve the, the title but it was through you know this very nuanced and technical you know weaving of of the rules and so we i don't i don't think that our societies have been terribly good in modern day to punish cheaters to 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 punish people because our social i think that our social fabric is pretty pretty damn strong and and that we we're going to keep people we're going to and and diverse so we're going to find ways of keeping people uh in the social fabric well more often than not i go back to some of the evolutionary psychology pieces thinking through this and that we are wired around fairness and so in small groups i mean you look at you look at the capuchin monkey experiments that franz de wall does right where you give them yeah. one monkey a cucumber and you give the other monkey a grape for doing the same thing and, and you see that response that youtube uh video that is out there. And I think that works in a small community. I think where it breaks down is we have 8 billion, almost 8 billion people on on the right. earth. Right. And how do you, how is that fairness then done? And then when you may have success with things, people are just looking at success and they're not necessarily looking at how do you get that success it's a crazy, it's a crazy world. And I think, um, yeah, that ends well, justifying that, the means is a slippery slope to a certain degree. But as you said, you're not when most of the time, and maybe, maybe I'm just looking at, uh, uh, outcome bias here that, you know, the, the survivorship bias, excuse me, of people, you know, succeeding, through maybe not so good means, and yet they're still successful. They still have huge people following them, admiring them, and looking at them. So it kind of weighs on you and goes, well, if they're doing it, maybe I should do it. And that's how I get ahead. So let's play that back into the uh, Alice Cooper story. Yeah. Where Wembley Stadium is not sold out. Shep Gordon has a brilliant idea of if, if I can get the parents to hate Alice Cooper, then I'm sure that the kids will love him and pays a guy to go out in Piccadilly circus and have his truck broken, br- break down, so to speak. Right. And then he, and then the guy gets arrested and, and uh, spends the night in jail uh, for, for this action. And, and there's a little bit of, well, it was okay. Cause he got paid for it. He, he kind of knew what he, the, I'm talking about the truck driver. Okay. Cause he knew what he was looking for. Um, and I, um, and there, and I, I get Michael's argument that this was a brilliant strategy that Shep Gordon came up with to to do um, to get people to buy tickets to to see Alice Cooper at Wembley. On the other hand, there was some cost uh, to it as well that this that this truck driver ends up you know getting arrested, has a record because he got put in jail for this obstruction, and there's there's a little bit of like yeah. It's, I don't know how good that is. And plus all the irritation that it caused drivers in Piccadilly Cir- Circus. I can only imagine that was well, and that's, painful. that's the piece, right? Is, is you are benefiting yourself with the cost to others. It's that concept. And I'm less concerned about the truck driver, I think, than the cost to all of those people who, who knows what was going on. Maybe somebody missed a really important meeting because they were stuck in a traffic jam and they might have lost a job. 
uh, somebody might have missed a date that might have led to a future uh, romantic relationship that led to a wonderful life. Uh, and regardless, even if it wasn't anything those big, the irritation of having to spend an extra 15 minutes in traffic across hundreds, if not thousands of people, just so that you get the publicity to sell out. Now, was there benefit of that? Uh, the, all the kids that got to go see Alice Cooper, they probably enjoyed it. They might not have realized that they would have enjoyed it so much. So again, going back to this utilitarian thing of Max Bazerman, how do you weigh that? How do you measure the value versus the pain? And it's it's tough. So those are questions that I think are always subjective in nature. And it's hard to get an objective measure to say, yes, the utility of this outweighs the cost. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the question. But one thing that we don't have to, to question is the fact that this was the f- maybe the first guest that brought up ministry. Ah, there we go. Right? So before like, before we go there, before we go there, I just one thing that that Michael said that I have taken out of this that I think is just brilliant is And I knew this, but he said it very eloquently. He said, our tribes are formed based on what we're against, not based on what we're for. That, again, thinking about the the Alice Cooper incident and getting, you know, we're against our parents authoritarian to us. And so if our parents don't like somebody, we obviously must like them. And I think that that's very true. And so from a perspective, if we're in thinking about our world, either business or even our personal world, it's good to examine that. And it's not always a positive thing. So particularly, particularly as we think about the politics that's going on today, I love those, those concepts. And we've talked about it with the messenger effect in different pieces, but if something is said and it is attributed to the opposing party, we hate it. If it's, if it's said, uh, but it's from our party, then we love it. And it should be based upon the content and the merit of the content. But instead, our tribes are really formed not so much about how good our content is, just as long as it's not the content of the opposite tribe. And that well, this is yeah, yeah this is the Bill von Hippel thing of of evolutionary psychology. We don't have to be the the best looking, strongest, most successful, brightest guy in the world. We just have to be better than the worst ones in the tribe. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that we get we get picked at least more than than somebody else. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and and That's that funny. brings us to ministry. <laughs> that brings us to ministry. First guest. Is it I think this is the first guest who voluntarily brought up ministry. I right? believe I believe so. And I'm thinking that, you yeah. know, that's a that's a pretty fun thing for me. Again, yeah, it was in that, my it was in my this. narrow bandwidth of of bands that <laughs> I could talk intelligently about. So yeah, you just find your happy place at that moment. It was when, it when was Michael brought it up. was the first time I felt like I actually had something intelligent to say in in the oh. musical conversation. So you always have intelligent stuff to say. You've always got good questions and good good thoughts around music. I, I always love your 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 questions about music. Oh, you are too kind. You are too kind. No, I'm serious. Yeah, no, totally serious. I I think that uh, you know, especially you know, I mean, I. I'm, I've got some training in it, you know, I, and and a, a, a real passion about it. You know, I I don't just like listening to music; I love listening to music. You know, yeah. I really and I and I I, I, I we we talked to Kuhn Smets a, a bunch, you know, a bunch of times. But it's like, we, you know, I was the kind of kid that looked at the album notes and was like, well, who produced this record? Oh, okay, so that was. That was that was this guy. That was Ron Ron and How, Howie Albert. Okay, who, what else did they? Put? Oh, they worked on the Bee Gees record. Oh, so I listened to the Bee. It's like, well, let's see, uh, who engineered that? Oh, well, that engineer also worked on this, and and you know, I would follow that stuff on all these back roads that I found fascinating and rewarding. Okay, so so, so I just have to say, I don't know if it was on Twitter or LinkedIn that Coon just sent something to you about um, uh, oh, who's the band that just broke up. Um, Daft Punk, th- yeah, yeah, Daft Punk, and and he had this yeah. this part of music that he was saying. I don't even understand what he said about this music, but something they did, and 
and I listened to it and I could not tell for the life of me what was going on. And it was like this whole thing and it was slowed down multiple times and saying, look at what they did. This was mad. And you, and you commented in on it and you're like going, this is masterful. And looking at the seven eighteenths or something, something. And I'm just sitting there going, I can't even tell what you guys are talking about, much less comment on it. So in eight bars, <laughs> there's, th- there's three chord changes. <laughs> And it, it okay, and, and and so in the first song that they they wrote, they use all eight bars with 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 a whole bunch of stuff going on to make those three chord changes. And then in the second song, they go back and they just take three of those bars and they rearrange them. They change the order and they change the number of time that each of those little samples get get produced to create an entirely new song with exactly those. Th- I thought three it was the bars. same song. I thought that was no, all so, within the same song. I think it's no, I think it's I different. It was I think all within the same song. That is the one song. We'll, we'll have to go back. We'll look at the, we'll look and we'll let you know in the show notes, folks, because this is getting way too crazy. People aren't, they're, they're tuning out at this point. So they're already, they're, they, they're already we gone. We're just talking to ourselves. All right. We're, we're only talking to people who are joggers. We're talking to Nula Walsh, I think, at this point, because she, she runs for more than 30 minutes. And <laughs> she so. can't turn this <laughs> off. Sorry, Nula. All right. Well, with that, uh, stay tuned. Tim's going to talk a uh, bonus track here soon. This is Tim with our bonus track and groove idea for the week. Our discussion with Michael brought up some philosophical questions that made Kurt and me contemplate our beliefs on a variety of fronts. Our conversation started by talking about if the world is more like 1984 or A Brave New World, and which would be better to live in. We went on then to discuss how Tim Ferriss won a kickboxing championship, even though he is not the best kickboxer, by exploiting a technicality in the rules. This led us to discuss asking the questions like, do the ends justify the means? And what are the ramifications for this sort of behavior? We then talked about what hype is and why it has a bad name. Michael looks at hype differently from the norm. He thinks that hype is identifying areas that are ripe to bring a new, fresh, but often controversial perspective. There are parts of hype that can be sensational, such as the discussion we had about Alice Cooper selling out Wembley Stadium in London. He did not do it by normal means. He did it not by getting on the cover of Rolling Stone to engaging kids and thinking that he was cool, but by getting coverage in the mainstream press that pissed off the parents. Having her parents disapprove of Alice Cooper meant that he was cool. The idea of our tribes are formed based on what we're against, not what we're for, is key to this idea. And that leads us to the groove idea for the week. We want you to create some hype about something that you're doing. Create some hype around a project or a product that you're working on by generating some factual but possibly controversial information. What are those things that would push convention and would cause people to pay attention to you in this busy world? We're going to try something here at Behavioral Grooves next week, so pay attention to see if you can figure out what we are trying to do to grab just a little bit of hype. And if you figure it out, let us know on Twitter and you can win a Behavioral Grooves coffee mug. A real life Behavioral Grooves coffee mug. We will ship it to you no matter where you live in the world. And with that, we hope you go out and find your groove this week.